We were turned away initially by the governor's national guardsmen. And then eventually we got into school with the help of the 101st Airborne Division, United States soldiers. And they cleared the way for us to go in. But even with the soldiers present, we had to put up with all kinds of tormenting harassment. We got beaten up every day. We got kicked around, spit on, scratched, tossed around, knocked cold, and acid in our faces, flaming balls of toilet paper over the stalls, you know, all that the usual and regular stuff that you find in high school, right? <laughs> Probably not. But we had to contend with that. But we had chosen to be nonviolent in the face of all of this, and you can do that, by the way. There is no need for human beings ever to fight. Did you know that? I'm speaking to the choir here, I know, because you guys don't fight, and that's good. But I'd just like to underscore that and let you know that humans do not fight. Lower animals, animals whose brains are too small, who can't reason, who can't think, have no power of speech, they fight because that's their default option. But you as human beings, you never have to fight. You have the power to reason, and that is a beautiful thing. And that's, that's what we felt. We were not going to fight these kids, no matter what they did to us, because we were not going to allow them to pull us down to that level. You see how it works? It's about how you see yourself. If you see yourself as being much too important to engage in that kind of animalistic behavior, then you don't. You rise above it. Why? Because your goals go far beyond that. If your goal is to beat somebody up, that's not very much of a goal. People have been doing that for centuries. <laughs> and it means nothing. But what is important is to use the energy you have and put it into the service of educating yourself. And I am keen on that. One of the reasons I joined this crowd of nine, well, not a crowd, really, a small group, of nine was because I believe in the power of education. Oh, absolutely. My first grade teacher was so helpful in that regard. She told me in first grade, she said, Terry Roberts, you have got to become the executive in charge of your own learning. You've got to take CEO responsibilities for your own independent learning enterprise. And once you do that, things take off. I took on that responsibility as early as first grade, and it pays off. I was fascinated because there was so much to learn. And like you, I couldn't wait to get to school. I was at school early, I stayed late. Oh yeah, they had to open the school doors for me. I was outside, knocking on the door. Let me in. And quickly made my way to the library. Why the library? Because the library is one of those fascinating places. All this wonderful written material on shelves, and you know what? It was free, you didn't have to pay for it. <laughs> what a bargain. At any rate, this was my attitude going in. I was somewhat surprised that the kids, some of the white kids at Central, walked out of school when we came. They were willing to sacrifice their own opportunity to educate themselves in the name of segregation. They actually walked out. That was one of the really shocking things. And they turned to us and said, we're, we're not coming back as long as you're here. <laughs> okay. See you later. <laughs> they didn't come back either. I don't know what they did. I think they were outside in the mob yelling and screaming. I could hear them. Every time one of the nine of us showed up at a window or a doorway, the, the, the volume went up outside. There they are. You know, they'd yell out stuff. They'd yell out all kind of crazy stuff. But we had already learned how to deal with that. You know, what other people say about you, that's none of your business. Think about that. What other people say or think about you is not your business. It can't be your business because if it were, you'd be running around trying to deal with everything everybody ever said. But when you realize that the only opinion that counts when it has when it does when it's about you, the only opinion that counts is yours. What I say about you, you don't have to worry about that. Even that young man who's sound asleep, you don't have to worry about him. <laughs> wow. Treated. <laughs> it's all right. Your fellows are picking on you. I call them out though. I am on your team. <laughs> I had a rating scale for the insults at Central High School. When kids would yell out insults, rather than get emotionally upset about it, I would rate it according to its creativity. <laughs> if the insult were creative enough, I would rate it pretty high on the scale. I had a scale of 1 to 10, 1 not so creative, 10, wow, off the chart. And nobody in that whole year ever scored above 2. I mean, they really weren't that good. They really weren't that good. I sometimes felt like giving them something that was creative, so, you know, we balance the thing. They were, as you guys might say, pretty lame. <laughs> <laughs> it's
Is that still popular? Has the word changed? Still say lame? Yeah, I have to keep up with you guys. <laughs> Things change so quickly in, in teen speak. Although, I was at a school earlier today and I was pleased that the students in that particular school, where were we at? Revis. We were at Revis School. And the kids did not overuse the word like. I was so surprised with that. Because many schools, kids seem to only know one word. The vocabulary consists of the word like, nothing else. And I thought to myself, wow, improvements have been made since the last time I was in Chicago. When I was growing up, there was a premium on learning more words than just one. <laughs> there really was. When, when I was growing up, you got, a, you got rewarded for learning a whole lot of words. So that's one of the reasons why I'm fascinated by this whole thing of learning. I did pick up the title nerd along the way. So a lot of people didn't appreciate that approach, so they call me nerd. They call me nerd primarily because I used to walk around with a dictionary. I carried a dictionary with me wherever I went. Why? Because once I figured out that language is the vehicle for communication, I wanted all I could get. I wanted to know as much about the language as I could. And that's one way to do it. So I still do that. I've got three or four dictionaries on my desk at home. And even on my little iPod thing, I have a thing called Word Play. It teaches me new words. And every so often I change the, the words. So I study them along the way. You think that's nerdy behavior? Well, whether it is or not, see, as I told you before, it didn't matter to me what you think. <laughs> doesn't matter. As long as I think it's okay, it is okay. That's absolutely the case. I have to take an executive control vote. That's being in charge. And by the way, when you, when you are able to communicate with some skill, you enhance your ability to navigate the terrain of life. You find out that opening certain doors for you become very easy, very easily done, as opposed to kids who don't have many words, especially if the only word you know is the like. So we got through that year somehow, beaten up. By the end of the year, we were pretty bad, it's physically and psychologically, beaten down. But you know what? I was ready to go back. I had one more year of high school. I started Central High School as a junior, 11th grade. I still had 12th grade to go. The governor stepped in, though, at that point. After the end of that school year, 57, 58, the governor of Arkansas closed down all the public high schools in Little Rock, closed them down, catlocked them, and said, nobody goes to public high school in Little Rock. Okay, that's the governor's ploy. And his reason for it was this. He wanted a segregated school system. He wanted to continue segregation. The law was against him. To defy the law, he closed the schools. What that did to me, it impacted my choices, certainly. I didn't have the choice of going to public school in Little Rock. I moved. I moved from Little Rock to Los Angeles. I had relatives in L.A., so it was an easy transfer. Made my way out to Los Angeles and enrolled in high school there and finished. During that school year, in December of that year, I persuaded my entire family to relocate from Little Rock to Los Angeles, and they did. And we gave up on Arkansas and became Californians. And sometimes you are, you know, forced to make those kinds of decisions. I've written about that in terms of the impact on a lot of people. You know, think about it this way. A lot of my white counterparts were not forced to move. And so they were able to continue building the foundations that had started as young children. And they were able to deal with that without having to interrupt and move and relocate and start over. So a lot of black people had to do that. And that has economic consequences when you think about it. So this whole thing of segregation has a wide and far-ranging impact. I've gone back to Little Rock since. In fact, I was hired by the school district in 1998 to be the official desegregation consultant. Now, they had no intention of actually using my services in a positive way. They were hiring me for PR purposes. They wanted to dangle me out to the public and say, hey, we're really good, we hired Terry Robbins. I took the job anyway, <laughs> with the intention of engaging in guerrilla warfare once I got there. See, that's another thing you have to do. But you have to be prepared for that. You also have to be prepared for the fact that you will be discovered at some point. I lasted for four years until I got fired. But that was just, there was no other way it could happen. Because I was not about to cave in to what they were doing. At any rate, I go back on occasion now, and Little Rock 